Amen. Well, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 22. We are continuing in our Easter series as we focus on the Son of God, the life of Jesus. And through the rest of the year, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. So if the Gospel of Luke is your favorite book, you are in a great place uh, because we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. Right now, though, we're focusing on the Easter events, the events leading up to the life, uh, or leading up to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. If you did not bring a Bible with you, you're welcome to use uh, the Bible under the seat in front of you, and you'll find Luke chapter 22 on page 1048. And as always, if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, please take our Bible home with you. We we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we believe if we read and apply His Word, He will change our lives. Now, I want to ask you a favor, if you would do me a favor, ask you a favor, yeah, ask you, if, what am I, French? <laughs> ask you a favor and, gosh, <laughs> and say the word favor for me, so... Would you welcome our Parker campus that's joining us today? Give them a round of applause. Welcome our Parker campus. Parker, we're so glad that you guys are there. We're excited about what God has been doing. We continue to pray for you, and we're excited about your future there at uh, Parker Calvary. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, jump up, grab one of the Bibles in the back of the room. Now, last week we looked at the Lord's Supper. Pastor Chad brought us to a place in our service as we looked at the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. We celebrated communion here at Calvary, and we worshiped, and we prayed, and we reflected. Last year, I saw many people, uh, last week, I saw many of you guys brushing away tears. And I think even Pastor Chad mentioned that in one of our services, that it seemed to be that many of you were moved emotionally. Now, I've been in ministry for over 24 years. I've led church-wide projects, over 20 mission trips, over 20 summer camps, over 50 weekend retreats. I've seen people experience incredible spiritual highs, and I've also seen people walk through some incredible spiritual lows. After this significant moment in the life of Jesus with his disciples in the upper room, Jesus went from a spiritual high to really what I see as a spiritual low. In the upper room, everything was amazing. They had celebrated the Passover. Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper. He washed the disciples' feet. But now they are going to leave the intimacy and the joy that they experienced in the upper room in Luke 22. And Jesus would experience such a high degree of temptation, of internal agony, that blood would begin to pour from his body like drops of blood or like drops of sweat. So today we're going to read this passage of scripture. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. You are welcome to follow along in the translation that you have. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 39. Then accompanied by the disciples... Jesus left the upper room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. 
Now, I'm sure most of you are aware of this. There's actually a medical condition called hematidrosis. You can look it up on WebMD, but don't ask me to spell it. On rare occasions when us as humans, when we experience such great internal agony, such great stress, on rare occasions, our body will produce sweat and it appears as though it's bloody. Bloody sweat will pour from our bodies at times on rare occasions and that is what Jesus was experiencing here in the garden. It wasn't a pretty picture. Jesus wasn't saying a churchy prayer in this prayer. He wasn't saying, oh, Lord, you know, whatever you want to do. Nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. Jesus was in agony over what was about to happen. And as he poured his heart out to God, he was kneeling on the ground, groveling, begging, and pleading with God that he would not have to suffer. This was Jesus, fully God and fully man, and he was experiencing the fear of death, of pain, and of torture. And it wasn't just the concern of, of death or pain or torture that Jesus was facing. That wasn't the only reason why he sweat the way that he did. In the garden, Jesus faced temptation to do what he wanted to do rather than what God wanted him to do. See, that's what he was wrestling with in this passage. Jesus was torn apart in agony because he wanted with all of his heart to be obedient to God. But in this moment, Jesus didn't fully want to walk the talk. Jesus was in agony because he wanted to obey God. But in this moment, he didn't want to carry the cross. He wanted to obey God, but he didn't want to be arrested. He didn't want to be tortured. He didn't want to be beaten. Jesus wanted to free people from their sins, but he didn't want to be crucified. That is what Jesus was faced with. That is why he sweat blood. He was torn with doing what he wanted to do versus doing what God wanted him to do. Have you ever wrestled with a desire to do what is right? Have you ever wrestled with a desire to, to do something that you know God wanted you to do, but you weren't fully on board with it? Well, that's kind of what Jesus was facing on an extreme level. So raise your hand if you've ever wanted to do something wrong. Right? We've been there and that desire, that want to do something wrong is not sin, but it is temptation. And unfortunately, Jesus faced temptation without his friends. Jesus faced temptation without his friends. All he asked his group of friends to do was to stay awake and to pray. This was a group of believers or this was a group of his followers that he had done life with for the last three years. I mean, as we read scripture, we recognize, well, Jesus cared for them. He, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. He allowed them to catch an incredible catch of fish. Uh, he laughed with them. He spent time with them. He invested in them even when nobody else would invest in them. He gave them hope. He showed them God's love. Jesus literally changed their lives. And now, when Jesus wanted them to pray, they couldn't do it. So Jesus faced the worst time of his life to, up to this point, all by himself and without friends. And unfortunately, maybe some of you know what that's like. 
Maybe you know what it's like to face difficulties and challenges, changes, diagnoses, temptation, and fears all by yourself. Maybe you don't have any friends that gather around you and pray for you as you walk through the struggles of life. Well, let me, let me tell you this. You don't have to settle for that. God has not created and designed you to be a spiritual lone ranger. God does not sit back and applaud at the load you carry on your own shoulders and say, wow, look how strong they are by themselves. I can't say this more plainly. If you are not in a life group, join a life group. Get plugged in. I, I have to confess to you, I absolutely love our life group. Christy and I have a group of friends in our life group that have gone to battle for us in prayer, and we've been able to go to battle with them in prayer. We've circled around them in prayer. They have circled around us in prayer. We have shed tears. We've laughed. We talk about God. We encourage each other. Our life group, and they would testify to this, our life group has been through the ringer together over the last three years just by the stuff that impacts you and I today, just by the same stuff that impacts you. Together, our life group has faced death. We've stared down divorce. We've seen reconciliation. We've walked through struggles with our own children and with our parents. And there is nobody else that I would rather do life with. Now, three years ago, I wasn't so sure about that. But we've grown to care for one another. We've established trust with each other. We've uh, built our relationships on God's word, on God's love, and we're seeking to demonstrate God's love to one another in practical ways. And if you are walking through this life alone, if you and your wife are walking through this life alone, can I tell you, you don't have to. Stop doing it. Sign up for a life group. My goodness, a three-week commitment to a life group just to get a taste of what it could be like is certainly worth it. And maybe you joined a life group in the past and it wasn't a good fit. That's possible. Let me encourage you. Try again. Because the fellowship, the friendship that you will have with friends is worth it. God has a circle of friends waiting for you, and they're going to help you turn and trust in God when you can't do it on your own. They will help you stand and face temptations of every kind. And if you are a follower of Jesus already, you understand that temptation overtakes all believers. I mean, you understand that, correct? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. That means that every temptation that you and I face in this life, other people face it as well. See, sometimes as a follower of Jesus, we convince ourselves that nobody struggles like we struggle. We think that everybody else has it together and we don't. We think something's got to be wrong with me. And we look around at other followers of Jesus and think, man, they must read their Bible all the time. They must not have any struggles. Their marriage must be perfect. I mean, look how clean their children are. <laughs> and we think they've got it all together. Out of curiosity, it, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my own insecurities, but would you help me know Raise your hand if you've ever thought that other people have it all together and you don't. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's where I've been. We have to understand this. Every marriage is hard. Parenting is hard. Finances 
are hard. Obedience to God is hard. Life is hard. And in the midst of the hard, just like in the garden, temptation overtakes every single one of us. I was in fourth grade and I was playing keep away. And in fourth grade, the way that we played keep away back then, we had two teams. Each team had to get the ball into the end zone. And it was a cross between football and rugby. So if you got the football or the ball or whatever it was, you had to get it into the end zone. If you didn't make it into the end zone, it's because the other team tackled you. And they didn't just tackle you, but they would pile up on top of you and prevent you from getting the ball. And so if you drop the ball, if you get tackled with the ball, the other team gets the ball. So here I am in fourth grade wearing my glasses because my parents weren't around and I have my spectacles on and they kick the ball. It goes up in the air and I'm following it. I scoop it up off the ground and I start running like mad. Well, the team starts, the other team starts zeroing in on me. You know how they get closer and closer. This girl behind me, her name was Tammy. She starts yelling at me, back door, back door. I had no idea what she was talking about. What she wanted me to do is pitch her the ball. What I thought she was telling me to do is to run towards the back door. And so I'm like, oh, there's the back door. And I take off running towards the back door of the school. I all of a sudden feel this sharp pain in my neck because Tammy reached out, <laughs> grabbed the short hair on the back of my neck and jerked me to the ground. The ball goes away and she stands over me and says, I said back door. I got it then. <laughs> can, can I tell you that I think many of us experience the same thing when it comes to temptation overtaking us. That same feeling that I felt on the ground, man, I laid there, I was disoriented, I was confused, I didn't understand what happens, what happened to me. I couldn't understand how my own teammate took me out. And I think that's how many of us, if we're a serious follower of Jesus, feel in life when we give into temptation to sin. We feel overwhelmed. We don't understand. We think everybody else has it together. We must not be really changed by Jesus. Maybe he really didn't work in my heart and life the way that I thought he did. I want you to hear me out on this. I want us to go back to that garden as we look at the temptation that Jesus faced. I think the reason why Jesus faced that temptation is because he remembered, he remembered what it was like to be able to do what he wanted to do. He remembered what it was like before he had submitted control to God. He remembered what it was like before he gave up his rights as God and took the form of a servant. I think the reason why Jesus was wrestling so much with, with whether he was going to listen to God and do God's will or flee or do whatever he wanted to do is because he remembered what it was like to be in control. He remembered what it was like to be Lord of all. You and I need to understand this when it comes to temptation in our lives that we face with certainty, memories of sin can stir up temptation in our lives. Memories of sin can stir up temptation in our lives. Now, I'm not suggesting that Jesus sinned before, the, before the, the garden. I'm not suggesting that Jesus sinned as God, but I'm saying that his memories of what it was like to be in control, that served as a temptation for him. He said, 
in great agony. Okay, God, not my will, your will be done. And I think that as followers of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, memories of your sin from your past can stir up a temptation in the future. It, that those memories kind of trigger the desires that you have. Now, I don't have any desires for things that I don't want in my life. I'm never tempted to step on tacks in my house. I'm never tempted to step on Legos in my house. I don't like the feeling, therefore I'm not tempted in that area. The temptations that you face in this life are there and exist because memories of something that you've done in the past kind of trigger a bit of pleasure. You liked it. It was enjoyable. See, think about just chocolate for a minute. Raise your hand if you like chocolate. Raise your hand if you will probably eat chocolate in the future. Why? Because you like it, right? And I think that when it comes to temptation to sin, we have to acknowledge that there was some type of pleasure about that sin that we wanted, we desired it, we liked it. Memories of experiences that appeal to us in the past can stir up our, uh, the temptation that we face in the future and in the present. If we liked it in the past, our flesh tells us we're going to like it again. And parents, let me just pause here and tell you, this is one of the reasons why it's extremely important that while your children are young, that you do whatever you can to protect what they experience. You protect and guard their hearts and guard their eyes. Internet filters, or routers with, syst with filters built into them, uh, covenant eyes, apps that you can download on your phone, in, uh, cell phone usage. If your child or your teenager stumbles one time in that area, those lingering memories of what they, that what they saw is going to stay with them for a lifetime. So parents, it's important that we do all we can to limit that type of temptation in our children's lives. So if it costs $50 a month to protect your family, it's so worth it. Guard against creating new memories that could lead to temptation in your life and in your children's lives. And practice prayer because I am firmly convinced that with prayer and friends, every temptation can be overcome. With prayer and friends, every temptation can be overcome. Jesus looked at his followers and said, pray, stay awake and pray so that you do not enter into temptation. Jesus knew what he was facing he knew that his disciples needed to pray and that prayer would somehow prevent the disciples from being tempted. If you've been walking blind into temptation after temptation in your life, strengthen your prayer life first. Uh, the brother of James wrote, uh, the brother of Jesus, James wrote this in James 4, 7. Humble yourselves before God Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Jesus demonstrated this in the garden. 
Jesus knelt down in agony. He poured his heart out to God. He humbled himself and he said, okay, not my will, but your will be done. He resisted the evil one. He resisted the temptation to do what he wanted to do as opposed to what God wanted him to do. And I want you to believe that Jesus will strengthen you today. That if you will commit your life to being transparent, not necessarily with everybody, but with a group of people, if you build trust, if you build relationships built on God's word, if you develop a stronger prayer life, I can guarantee you all those ingredients will help you overcome temptation. I'm not going to say that you're going to live perfectly, but I will guarantee you have a higher likelihood of resisting temptation when you strengthen your prayer life and you have friends around you that you can talk to, that can encourage you and you can encourage them. If you surround yourself with friends, if you begin to pray like never before, if you humble yourself before God, every temptation in your life that you face can be overcome. You have Jesus on your side who is fighting for you. I love what the author said in Hebrews 2.18 when he was describing temptation, talking about temptation. He said, since he himself, talking about Jesus, has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help you when you're being tempted. Since Jesus endured temptation, since Jesus knew what it was like to experience temptation, he will help you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. He cares for you. Not only did Jesus suffer on the cross for you, even when, when he submitted his will to God and said, God, you're in control. He knows what it's like to have that desire to do what you want to do as opposed to what God wants for you. That, that means in your parenting styles, that means in your marriages, that means at your work, in all those areas of your life where you're tempted to do your will, when you're tempted to love yourself before you love others, when you're tempted to live how you want to live, Jesus is there, he understands, and he wants to help you. And scripture tells us he is able to help us when we're tempted. So how do we submit to God? How do we resist the devil? It is through prayer. The picture that we see in the garden is a picture you can live out every single day. Falling onto your knees, humbling yourself before God, crying out to him, even when you feel like your, your body's being torn apart in agony, submitting to him and prayerfully, you'll have a group of friends that you can talk to as well, that you can ask them to pray for you about particular temptations that you face in your life. God's able to, and you're able to resist so as a follower of Jesus, I encourage you, find people that you trust, talk with them and strengthen your prayer life because limiting temptations in our lives can be done if we allow it to. Let's pray together. Father, it's our prayer that as we look at this passage of scripture and we see the example of Jesus pouring his heart out, it's our prayer that you would help us all to humble ourselves before you, 
We thank you so much for the work that you've done in our lives. We thank you if we're a follower of Jesus that you have set us free, that you have changed us, that you have transformed us. And now God, it's our prayer that you would continue to help us stay alert, resist the devil, be aware of his tactics and change us. Father, I pray that every marriage would be strengthened. I pray that every, every parenting, uh, every parent, would stre- you would strengthen their relationships with their children. Father, it's my prayer that you would guard eyes, guard marriages, guard, guard hearts of every person in this room and that you would help us all together as a body of believers just to resist temptation and to follow you. Thank you for this incredible passage of scripture. And thank you for Jesus' willingness to be transparent to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.